This will be breakout groups led by leaders from IGRO, Cinnaron Halstead, and Victory Gardens Theater to discuss ways in which we can make change through our schools, communities, and through our art. So why are we here? As we've seen in the past few months, the call to action to end gun violence, led by young Americans across the country, has never been louder. And we want to amplify those voices this evening. I'm going to share an excerpt from a speech given by Parkland shooting survivor and activist Emma Gonzalez, which should really encapsulate why we felt the need to gather you all. Emma says, companies are trying to make caricatures of teenagers these days saying that we are all self-involved and trend-obsessed, and they hush us into submission when our message doesn't reach the ears of the nation. And we're prepared to call BS. Politicians who sit in their gilded house and senate seats funded by the NRA telling us nothing could have been done to prevent this, we call BS. They say tougher gun laws do not decrease gun violence. We call BS. They say a good guy with a gun stops a bad guy with a gun. We call BS. They say guns are just tools, like knives, and are as dangerous as cars. We call BS. They say no laws could have prevented the hundreds of senseless tragedies that have occurred. We call BS. That us kids don't know what we're talking about, and that we're too young to understand how the government works. We call BS. With that, I'm proud to welcome Emily Hooper Lonsna from the Logan Center at the University of Chicago. She'll be joined by teachers Joel Ewing and Jessica Dean Turner, and students Eldridge Brown, Cleo Shine, and Damianti Wallace. Please join me in welcoming to them to the stage. of the need to struggle. But when the powerless start to see that they can really make a difference, nothing can quench the fire. We are in a moment where we see fires starting um, all across the country and indeed all across the world. And in many cases, as has been true throughout history, the fires are being started by young people, the fires are being started by creative people, the fires are being started by artists. And so I'm thrilled to be here this evening with a group of teachers and young artists. And I'd just like to ask everyone, um, starting at the end, if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, your work and your perspective on these issues. All right. Uh, my name is Jessica Dean Turner. Um, I am a lifelong Chicagoan, born and raised on the west side. I currently teach at Shy Arts. Um, and I also uh, facilitate discussions about how we can make this world a little less racist and a little less sexist. Uh, because I think that the way to deconstruct the violent society that we live in is through dismantling these larger, oppressive constructs that we have going on. Um, did I answer all of the, the things? <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, I'm Joel Ewing. I am the lead theater teacher at Set Arts Magnet High School. Uh, I'm the artistic director of The Yard, which is a youth-driven theater company uh, here in Chicago. Um, similar to Jessica, I try and make the world a little better place. Uh, I do some art along the way while having some conversations with the young people that are making it. And uh, shortly after Parkland had occurred, I was talking with my freshman ensemble and one of my freshman theater artists kind of innocently but quite frankly asked me uh, uh, when I was kind of explaining my uh, response to Columbine, uh, my student said, well, what did you do when that happened? And I didn't have a really, really good answer. Um, so I think I've just been trying to find a better answer ever since. Hi, my name is Damianti Wallace. I'm a junior at Shy Arts, and I'm a creative writing major there with a focus in poetry. Um, the work I do kind of looks like combining art and activism mostly, and trying to find the balance between what 
my poems and what my plays look like and how that can be put out into the world and do the work that it needs to do to be able to kind of like, yeah, take down these bigger, these bigger things that are oppressing us in a way. So over the last few, about four years, I've just been trying to like dig deeper and find that work and that's like being a part of conversations like this or performing or um, introducing myself to one of the teachers. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Clea Shine. Um, I'm currently a senior at Santa Arts High School. I'm in the theater de um, department. I am about to be a freshman at MICA for filmmaking, so I kind of coined myself a filmmaker, also an actor, also a writer sometimes, and I do poetry also. Um, and so I'm also a member of The Yard and um, part of the cast for the upcoming show um, at Sutton Wolf with The Yard um, of Columbinus. And recently with um, this movement and just with uh, social justice work in general, um, I've, I've never really uh, led protests or led walkouts or anything um, like that. Um, but recently I've, I've been trying to step up at my school and kind of get the word out to that, those smaller communities and um, those people like kids at my school that just don't know how to take the action um, and kind of lead those causes and getting the action taken by you know people that wouldn't know where to start, if that makes any sense at all. Hi, I'm Eldridge Brown, and I'm an eighth grader at Sherwood Elementary. I'm also the youngest TT trainer at Zen Yoga Garage. Uh, I actually scheduled a walkout. Um, I was honestly crazy because I asked my principal, she was like, no, you'll be suspended. Talked to my teachers, she was like, yeah, I'm down, got her colleagues. And if you look up, we saw the assistant principal and the principal out there with us. And I was like, I just was like, I was taking some word and something happened. And this could be history. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in this moment, uh, I'm thinking about the excerpt from the play and this question of what it takes to motivate us to make a change and um, how we can be living in a situation where we see violence all around us and we can normalize it and that we have reached a moment in this country where we have normalized um, an incredible level of violence. And so I'd like to ask um, the panel to just speak on specifically the question of gun violence in this country and the role that you see art and activism playing collectively uh, to address the issue. Um, I'm only 14, <laughs> and I've seen about five of my friends die due to gun violence. One, I've literally watched his brains actually explode from his head, and to this day, I sit and look at like food, like noodles, oatmeal and stuff, and I hesitate before I eat it, and ever since then, I've always thought like, something has to change, something has to give, because it was my friend that passed through to this, and I don't want else to feel my pain, because it's not good at all. For me, it's mostly just the people around me and the stories that I hear from them, and sometimes all it takes is a word, like sometimes that's what inspires you because often like what our brains do, you hear something and then you start tracing back a memory or then you start thinking deeper into it or overanalyze, like I overanalyze everything. And mostly just like if somebody says something sexist for me, uh, women can't do this, they can't because of this or women of color, then for me it just traces back so much and I start thinking of everything that my ancestors have gone through, everything my parents, my grandparents have gone through 
And that's, that sparks something in me. That's where my inspiration comes from because we shouldn't have to go through that. It's something that's been, it's systematic. So, and for me, it's just about breaking that down. It isn't, it's, yeah, it's just about breaking it down. It doesn't have anything to do with like, me, it's like, it looks like other people. And seeing like, seeing all of you, if like you told me a story, that's what sparks me, you know, that's where my inspiration comes from. Um, we've been talking a lot about um, kind of the pattern of societal behavior after uh, an event like Parkland and uh, yet another shooting, to your point of, of normalizing um, and, and uh, media cycles, uh, things like that, before kind of our collective apathy or just life in general takes over and we try and find a way to move forward. Uh, and I think what's interesting about, <clears throat> for us, Fully grown folks that, you know, um, when, when, when Columbine happened, it was so hard for us to imagine a world where something like that could happen. Um, and I think what's interesting about uh, discussing this issue or making art about this issue alongside young people today is they can't imagine a world without it. Um, and it's such a, such a stark difference uh, in, in that regard. Um, so I think that has been interesting to, to examine, uh, and, and I think, like for me personally, as a, as a parent and as an educator, uh, I, I, I quite frankly lost all hope on this issue after Sandy Hook. Um, once Sandy Hook happened and it, it led to essentially nothing legislatively, societally with the issue, I was like, I can't, I can't imagine something worse that would, that would incite uh, some change. Um, and that's kind of a dark place to be in on it. Um, but I think what was different about February, about the students of Parkland, about the students in Chicago, about the students that are sitting on this panel today, is that they kind of refused to, to let it be normalized uh, in a really inspiring way. Kind of for the first time, it was uh, these young people and these people that were the, uh, the direct victims, uh, kind of like the play spoke to a little bit about the issue that refused to let it go in a really exciting way. And, and as, an, as an adult, uh, mentor or teacher that was just so inspiring for me to kind of like uh, examine my role in the fight again um, in a really exciting way. I think that as an artist, when I'm in a creative space, I feel the privileges that I don't necessarily feel as a six foot black woman walking through the streets. I know that when I have the floor on a stage, that people will listen to me in a different way than if I'm just crazy Jess out of Jewel or whatever that is. <laughs> but I think that the arts and activism will always align and they always have to because anything that you produce, you've already made decisions about what bodies get to tell this story, why we need to tell this story, and it's contextualized in whatever historical moment that we happen to be in. So what is so inspiring in this very dark timeline that we're in is that these young people who are often, we don't <coughs> value their voices as much as we should, but they have so much to teach us. And since they have, like Joel said, have lived in a world where violence is normative, their stories and their narratives are how we're gonna find our way out. So I think that, yes, uh, the aesthetic space is what we, need to present these ideas because in a creative arena we can let our guard down a bit and so we can slip in those ideas that don't necessarily feel like oh this is a TED talk about violence but we can activate those parts of the brain that will trigger our empathy and our critical thinking skills. Years ago I heard uh, August Wilson speak and he was asked why he decided to become a playwright. And he said, essentially, as a playwright, as a black man in America, I suddenly have people held captive to listen to my ideas for three hours. <laughs> and I find that to be very powerful. And I think that for us as artists, that the ability to tell our stories and to have people listen to them is very powerful. 
historically, we know that there have been many moments in history where it is young people's voices that have uh, brought the tide for change. When you think about the Birmingham Children's Crusade and young people in the March for Selma and um, the Freedom Rides and the sit-ins and today in the Black Lives Matter movement um, and other movements across the country, there have been young people who have stood up and said, we believe that change must happen. Um, I'd like to ask you all what um, both creatively and politically helps you to feel encouraged. So we recognize that this is a challenging time, but when you're feeling like I need to feel motivated, I need to feel, continue to feel committed to the struggle, like what makes you feel encouraged? What makes you feel I cannot give up? Uh, I'm gonna be honest, I'm a junior counselor at Iowa Chicago, and every time I step into the Peace House, there might be something on my mind. I might be like, oh man, I, I'm not very sure about this, but when I actually get into the Peace House, if it gets just, even if it's just looking around the Peace House, I get courage. It's like, it's like a beautiful place. It might be on a small area, small block, but it's like a beautiful place. And it's just like, it's like something I could just take from it. So my self-esteem and everything would just be built up. I think that um, one thing I struggle with in all aspects of my human life um, is getting motivated. Um, you know, whether it be schoolwork or making um, or anything, motivation is always something that it, I have to really uh, design. Um, I have to kind of captivate my own motivation and build it in order for it to be a productive space for me. Um, and so one thing, especially with uh, this movement and political movements in general, that's been really motivating is finding a person that I can bounce off of. Um, and so I've been working at my school with uh, my, the student body president, Rory Hayes, and my friend Maytov, um, and just working with those two people and being and having those that like-mindedness um, has always been really, really helpful because we can just bounce off each other really quickly. We know how to communicate with each other. I think that's super important is finding someone you can communicate with, finding someone that has the same passions as you. Um, and if like you yourself are an artist, I think finding someone who is artistic as well can help because then you think in that that creative way and you can find um, solutions to political and social justice issues through innovation even though you think that those things don't play together. Um, a lot of people see political movements um, as one track, I guess, um, as, as power, as aggression. And they can still, you can still be soft in a political movement. Not soft like weak, but soft like soft-hearted. And you can still show your empathy in a political movement and I think that finding people to connect with on that level, who aren't just like, oh, aggression is the way to get your voice out, is really, really helpful because there are other ways to find um, outlets. For me, it's also people. Like, um, I get really nervous before doing anything, and recently I've been involved in a lot of demonstrations. And so before I like leave the house, or right, like leading up to the minute before, there's like butterflies in my stomach. I'm like, oh my god, what's gonna happen? Anything could happen. And I have this like small, it's like five of us group of people who we do a lot of organizing together, and we're involved in a lot of groups. And they're my like safe haven, and they're kind of like my sanctuary. Where like if I'm freaking out, they're like, calm down. We're all here together. If anything happens, it'll all happen together. And so that for me is my motivation. Also, just the other people involved. Um, an example, we did a die-in at City Hall a few weeks ago. Um, it was like the week of spring break for CPS. And um, I was so nervous. We were sitting, um, listening, and Ron was about to talk. We were sitting in City Hall, Ron was about to talk. And we started to do a mic check. And the police came up to us, starting to like, escort us out of the room. And I, my legs were shaking. I was like, I cannot do this. They're going to arrest me and take me away. And I'm never coming back. Like, there were so many things running through my head. And then, like, my friend just kind of, like, grabbed my hand. And, like, we moved together. And then it just, from there, it was, like, bliss. It was just, like, 
we can do anything. Like, we can do anything in the world. So for me, it's those people, and it's just the other people who are there, too. Like, everybody is always so supportive when it comes to things like that because we know that anything could happen. Like, once we got to the first floor and started doing the sit-in, they weren't letting us go to the bathroom. They weren't letting us eat. They weren't letting us have water. Like, they were threatening to, like, lock us on the elevators. And it was just everybody standing in solidarity saying, like, we're going to stand this ground for as long as we have to for you to understand what we need to happen. We were protesting the $95 million Cop Academy uh, in, that Brown was planning to build in Garfield Park. And um, we were just standing there all together. And that, like, that was the epitome of motivation for me. So I always, like, I feel like I can go back to moments like that when I'm feeling very down, when I'm feeling like I can't do this anymore. Because there are people who support, support me and support the people that do this work no matter what. And you could meet them five minutes ago, or you could have known them for five years, and it's still the same level of support. Um, I'm so inspired by the um, the intersection of art and activism with so many young uh, artists that I see today, uh, as well as those individual efforts being supported by larger institutions to give them space uh, and, and both a kind of literal and metaphoric stage with which to do their work. Um, so there, there, I mean, there are countless youth organizations that have been, uh, you know, in the game for a long time, but. Uh, every year, Young Chicago Authors and Louder Than a Bomb um, continues to be one of Chicago's greatest cultural assets. Um, Victory Dar Gardens does uh, tremendous work in CPS schools with the August Wilson monologue competition that you mentioned, um, and, and, and this year at the finals, um, which these which two people were part of, right? Um, were, uh, uh, it, it was as if those words were as applicable today as they were when August wrote them. Uh, you know, decades ago, uh, uh, Free Street Theater, Albany Park Theater Project. Uh, I mean, the, the yard is new to the game relatively to those organizations. Um, but it's not only those organizations, it's then those organizations partnering with larger kind of capital I institutions to like literally unlock the door and give them space. Uh, we've been fortunate to align with Victory Gardens and perform here on this campus. Uh, uh, Steppenwolf, uh, 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 co-producing Columbinus with us, uh, the Goodman's work with Albany Park Theater Project, because we, I think, as educators and young people know, right, but you don't know until you know, and it's usually not through, the, it's not until those institutions give them that larger platform that I think a broader audience can start to be inspired by their work, because sometimes that can be the danger of art and activism, is your art is not activating anyone new, per se, um, it can fortify the resolve of people that are already on your side, and that's important too. But um, I, I think uh, giving a larger stage, a bigger microphone, a bigger platform for these young people to continue to lead the charge and us kind of like step back a little bit, <laughs> uh, provide some insight or support or organization along the way if we can, but for the most part, um, that's what I continue to be inspired by every day. Yes, uh, I'm a little like all these, <laughs> yes, <come> on, <laughs> but yeah, there's so many, to your point, there's so many organizations that have been doing this work, and I think that what is very inspiring about this moment is that the light is being shown on them. I, what happened with the, the Parkland students and how we are seeing them, you know, take the stage and, and step out into the forefront, it's casting a light in its wake for all these other organizations like Asada's Daughters and who have been doing actionable work in their community. So whenever I feel depleted, I look at all these people who are much younger than me, all the work that they continue to do. I look to my elders who are still out here swinging. So there is no excuse, even because you have to take your self care, you have to you know call your people and drink your water and do all those things because we can't give from an empty vessel, you can't, you have to put your mask on before you hand it to someone, you know, the airplane. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, there's so much work that, that is constantly happening here in the city that there is no shortage of inspiration if you're open to it. So many of us who are involved both as artists and activists are fighting for uh, a different kind of world than we're experiencing right now. We imagine a place where we will feel safer. We imagine a place where we will feel 
that there are more platforms for broader voices, um, where people will feel more empowered. And I just want us to take a moment to say, if the fight that we're fighting right now, if we were to win, um, how would the world look different? How would Chicago look different? How would our communities look different? <coughs> You don't have to pick all of them, you can pick one. If we won. Mm -hmm. I think that the ways in which schools in the neighborhood that I grew up in, they would look a lot less similar to prisons. I think that black and brown students would be less uh, criminalized from the moment that they walk out the door. If we won this I think that we would be able to have better conversations about consent and rape culture and anti-racism and that opportunity and access to arts and education because not everybody gets that, um, has access to that. I think that that would be plenty. I think that the conversation about if we should spend $95 million on a cop academy, would begin and end with that's foolish. Uh, there's so many other places that need that money. Um, I think that if we won mental health and how that impacts communities and how that impacts intracommunal violence, that would be addressed instead of just assuming the worst in poor uh, communities of color. Ooh, I'm gonna pass this because <laughs> everything Jess said. <laughs> uh, I know if we won, I don't know. Um, I could put both my bullhorns back in the prop department and not have to actively use them for another teacher strike. Seemingly every other year, that'd be exciting. Uh, not that I would look good in red, but like that gets tiresome after a while. Um, so I think a little bit more support uh, for, for teachers in a more just educational system and writ large for CPS, but that would be another town hall. Um, I don't know, in terms of art, you know, I think Chicago has, has really been at the forefront of this idea of representation and inclusion on stage, and that's so inspiring and so exciting. I think there's obviously still work to be done on that front, but uh, if we were to win, I think our audiences in those theaters uh, would look a little bit more like what we see on stage. Um, so I think that's kind of our next step. Obviously, Victory Gardens is kind of at the forefront of that, too, with the artist work that are, 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 are being produced on these stages and what the audiences look like in these houses night after night. But um, I, would say, I would say from an artistic standpoint, that would be an exciting next step to continue that discussion about inclusion and representation. But I don't think that should just end at, the, at, at, at downstage. Um, I think that should continue on into our houses as well. If we won, that's um, first. It's wild because I can't imagine it. So I just, for years and years and years, imagine fighting. So like, the win is kind of like down, down, down the road. Um, if we won, I think like it would it would look like people wanting to listen to me and other people who look like me without needing like the stage part of it and without like the art behind it because I think mostly the problem is like people, children of color don't get listened to a lot unless they're performing or unless they're like on a stage or have a mic and or unless they're like yelling angry in the street and then it's just a bunch of people retweeting it on Twitter and um, also the gun conversation while like being erased but like it would get listened to in inner cities rather than it just being like a school shooting. Like kids in Chicago, kids in like Baltimore would be heard rather than it having to be like in a school or where they're having to be like a certain number of victims. Like their daily their daily trauma would get listened to. Um, like Ms. Turner said, mental health would be so much better um, because now we're closing mental health centers and. Yeah, I think I think youth being at the forefront wouldn't be such a shock anymore. Um, 
Because I think even if we won, like there would still be a fight and there would still be something that we're doing and something that we have to demonstrate and it wouldn't it probably wouldn't be as big as this would be something we could change quicker if we won. But I think youth being at the forefront it wouldn't be so revolutionary and it wouldn't be so um, different and people wouldn't be asking like, How do you feel that youth are now at the front and people are finally listening to you? And it's like, uh maybe should have listened the whole time? I don't know. Um, so yeah, it just it looked better. I don't know, more purple. Um, like everyone else said, I think that uh, if we won, we wouldn't have to be asking if we won. Um, <laughs> if we won, I wouldn't, you know, like, I'd feel like safe at school, that'd be cool too. Um, I wouldn't like jump at the sound of a textbook falling in the hallway either. Um, I think, I think if we won, we wouldn't have to say you're so woke anymore because that would just be called being a human being. Um, and like we wouldn't have to draw that line. We wouldn't have to use social justice as a social status um, because I found that that's happening a lot where people are like, oh, well, like you're fake woke. And it's like all of a sudden you need to get woke because you need to be popular. You need to feel like that's a validation for you when you should just, you know, be a good person. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, like everyone else said, if we won, um, we wouldn't have to have this conversation. Um, we would be able to have this conversation on the daily by just sitting and being with people and talking with people. We wouldn't have to like organize how to talk about these things, and we wouldn't have to dance around them either. It wouldn't have to be like, oh, well, I'm going to my grandparents' house in Pennsylvania. I should keep it on the low. Um, it would be like, oh, here's the thing I think. What do you think about the thing I think? Um, that paradoxical sentence made any sense, but yeah. <laughs> um, if we want, like everyone else said, I would think it would be safe. But we also do have to think about It'll be a change, but we also have to think about the people that disagree with what we agree with. So, like, they still have their opinion of what they think. So, even that we won in their minds, they think it's not over. So, we still have to think ahead on certain things. Um, it would be a lovely thing to say we won. <laughs> <laughs> like, my lovely friend right here said, I don't have to jump at something when it makes a big boom or something. I wouldn't be able to, I would have to duck my head every time I walk in a well-known bad neighborhood. Or every time somebody drives over a pop or I would flinch. So being able to say we won actually would give me more, how can I say, make me feel more safe and more secure. I think it's critically important for us to be able to imagine a world in which we could win. Despite the fact that these same realities that we're fighting for, people have been fighting for, for years and years and years, for equality, for safety, for empowerment. But I think in order for us to continue the fight, we have to be able to imagine um, that that question of allowing our imagination to create a new space even if it is a new space that we are not able to experience. I think that that is the work of artists, that we allow our creative space to make a thing possible, and that there is something empowering and healing in being able to do that work. Um, I think that for those of us who are serious about activism, it is critical that we not allow that creative space to become so far away from reality that um, that, that there, there is a place that a bridge cannot cross. And if we are living in a moment where our children are afraid because of the sounds they hear, they're afraid when they go to school, fear is, um, killing us, uh, in, in many ways. And so I wanted to take a moment to actually imagine what, what it would be like if we won, because I think that that's critically important. 
Um, we're going to just do one last round of questions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. And I just wanted to say, if you were going to talk to someone who hasn't been involved in uh, being active in fighting for change, for peace, um, against gun violence, um, for empowerment, if you were going to speak to someone and try to say to them, you know, you should be involved, what do you think is the, uh, what is one way, one really important way that you would say to them, this is a thing that I think you can do, and this is a thing that I think, because I think sometimes people feel like it feels too big, I don't even know where to start. What is the thing that you would say, this is a thing you can do? Um, you say one thing, right? Well, it could be more than one. <laughs> I would I'm just go with one thing. I have a lot done. I don't think I have enough time. I would say, I have my community. If you would like to try this, go with your community and try this. There's enough time for me to think. Um, I was looking for a paragraph there. Um, <laughs> I've kind of faced this already with a lot of the kids at my school who are like, I'm not going to walk out. I don't think it's going to work. And I'm like, well, here's the thing. Um, I would say no matter how small your action is, whether it be, you know, a retweet or whether it be attending something like this or no matter how big it is, whether it be planning a walkout or attending a protest or, you know, going to D.C. or calling a senator, um, it still matters, and even the smallest steps can create bigger change because they all accumulate in the long run. I actually have a friend who says this all the time. Uh, we are very opposite, and I say to her a lot, and I'm like, look at yourself in the mirror and know that there are people who, are, who look like you on a regular basis, and talk to your mother, talk to your aunt, talk to the people around you, and that's what other people are feeling. When, when someone dies or when someone's going through um, something with mental health, imagine yourself. Put yourself in their shoes and feel what they're feeling and fight for you. Essentially, fight for yourself and you're fighting for all these other people too. Um, I would make a play about it. Um, I'd make a play about it. Uh, I'd be conscious of who I invited to come see that play about it. Um, I would find uh, a way to surround myself with smart, creative people uh, to make any form of art about it, to give us that distance, to give us the chance to reflect, to give us the opportunity to express that reflection back out um, uh, to an audience of our peers, of our family members, of strangers. Um, I would tell people to register to vote, um, which I know that can be a very disheartening thing too and also feel like you're not making any sort of impact whatsoever. But shortly after uh, so many Chicago students were organizing you know, walkouts and protests and marches, and not that all of them can vote yet or can register because many of them cannot, but then you know, the, the, the results of the primary election came out and the percentage of people 18 to 26 that voted in the primary was abysmally low. Um, so I would tell people that like, while also organizing your protests and walkouts, uh, make sure you are, are signing up for the, the civic duty that can uh, also form an expression protest. So your vote. Yes, vote. Um, I, I make a really good status. I'm not very good in person, but I, I can make a really good status on Facebook. And like, I, I got paid recently. Someone sent me a little money on the PayPal. They're like, I shared what you said with my family. So that, that's, you can do that. Um, also, for, for the folks who, who think that their actions are minuscule or they feel like any type of activism has to be huge and they have text message services where I can text my representative a full email. Um, you can download an app called Countable where you can find out who these folks are that are in power and how you can lean on them without ever having to speak to a human because that can be a little hmm, calling someone, but we can 
send things out. So you can take like tiny steps until you're ready to take a bigger step. Or if you want to make a million tiny steps, that's still a greater distance than no tiny steps at all. Thank you. Um, I would say that I think that we all need to recognize that we have a lot to learn from each other and that we can keep learning and that um, it's important to cross a divide. So I am 52 and this young man is 14 and I learned an awful lot from him today. And I think that we tend to organize ourselves in groups and create boundaries that say this section has the knowledge and this section does not. I think it's critically important for us to recognize that um, knowledge can cross boundaries in important ways. So uh, we'd like to open up to the audience and take a few questions. For the oh, first I'm, I'm going to make a comment. I think that it's very important that people understand that it's not the NRA money that is so crucial. It's the fact that they get out the vote. And that's why it is so important for people to get out to vote. And it seems to me that the younger students who cannot vote, they can drive a car. And they could go out and organize and drive people to the polling place who need to drive there. And that can be their participation. All right, thank you. Yes. Um, you know, we hear a lot about the people who have a who arm themselves, who are living in homes in fear of home invasions or in fear of some sort of crazy government crap. I don't know. If some some, some government is going to come and take out take everything away. But we rarely hear the perspectives from the people who live in the, in the hood, who live in the inner cities. And you know, you hear you many many times people are facing direct threats of being shot, and the only way. To, to in, in, in their eyes to, to, to combat those threats is with their own guns. And this this is this is not some fear mongering thing. This is a, this is something that happens often. So what do you say to those people? Well, I spent a significant part of the time that I've lived in Chicago living near the corner of 79th and Cottage Grove, which is one of the most violent corners in the city of Chicago. And I have seen a gun shot. I have seen, um, I have experienced intense violence in my neighborhood. But what I consistently also experienced is that I, I watched someone shoot a gun not intending to, to use it as a tool of fear. And every time I think, are you thinking about where that bullet is going to land? Because even when we are holding guns, as we say, to protect ourselves, so much of the time, the bullet does not land where it was intended to land. And so um, I believe that we need to be much more conscious of the fact that when people live in fear, that fear is like an illness and it spreads. And that we all need to feel that if I'm living in a space where I feel safe, but 10 miles away from me people don't feel safe, that those people still matter to me. And that I need to be engaged in creating an, uh, a spreading of safe rather than a spreading of fear. That's my response. Other question, comment, you right here. Uh, Cleo, this is really directed at you, but anybody can answer it. You have said that you try to influence people who are like-minded to join whatever you're doing. So walk out. What do you do or how do you talk to people who are not like-minded who you want to try and influence? Um, yeah, so I've encountered this recently, and um, especially with people at my school. Um, not in many a Facebook conversation, I'm not going to call it an argument, because it was a conversation, um, regarding posts that they've made. Um, uh, there are some people in my school that right after the Parkland shooting decided it would be a jolly old time to post memes about it. Um, and so me and some of my friends um, approached them 
on the net about um, this, and some of my friends were a little bit more aggressive. And it was hard, it's hard to not be aggressive in that situation, right? Because you're like, this is, this is coming from my heart and your passion just kind of explodes. Um, and so approaching people with facts, I think is one of the best things. Because yes, people have opinions, but people are more likely to believe you if you have evidence to back up said opinions. And so approaching, also I feel like a lot of people, when you approach someone with a very different idea than you, people get defensive. And the only way to respond to defense and anger is with defense and anger. And so you're never, it's, you're just talking to brick walls there, right? You're just, you know, like, there's nothing, there's no communication occurring at that point. And so it's about approaching people and taking that shield down of like, you know, forgetting the opinion, this opinion, this opinion, this opinion, what they said, what they said, what they said, and kind of removing that and just seeing this human being and seeing how their brain works and using your ethos and your pathos and your logos and kind of, um, and, and being able to connect with them and reach them on a personal level in order to change their mind. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, um, I, I feel like the whole country is full of people yelling at each other a lot. And, you know, it starts at a certain place, too, so it's hard. But I don't, I don't think that works. And I think especially at this time, it's really, really important for when you disagree with someone. My sister voted for Trump. I did not. Um, and I have, but I love my sister. I love her dearly. And I believe she's a good person. She does good in her life. And it's really, I find it really important to reach, for us to try and reach each other's hearts and recognize our hearts and say namaste if you want, you know? And and start from that. Because arguing, I mean, you can say facts, but there's lots of facts out there, and I've, I don't even want to get into it with some of the NRA people. You know, I mean, it just isn't helpful. I think that one of the challenges <coughs> is that many of us are experiencing a kind of pain that makes us angry and that there isn't a lot of space to address that. And so I think that it's important to recognize that anger isn't always a bad thing, um, that we have to have space for it, but um, like this space right here is a space where we are all having a conversation. And I think that we can all take responsibility for creating more spaces to have collective conversation where different kinds of people with different perspectives, different journeys in their life can sit down together and have a conversation. But when we come to that table, we have to recognize that the journey that I have followed, the journey that he has followed, the journey that she has followed, Every journey inside this room is different. And the steps that we have taken on that journey may make some of us enter into it at different places than others. That would be my response. Yes? Uh, <clears throat> I can't hear all the questions, but maybe it's been asked already. But I wanted to mention that uh, it, it appears that conflict resolution is not thought out very well. And I'm a younger generation. And to me, that could be part of the problem. Being able to solve a conflict, being able to rationalize and reason with some logic. And whatever that, you don't have to go to that extreme. Go and purchase a gun, pull the gun out, and then use it. That's three, three, three different steps. So where I'm confused, and I, I, I think about this a lot, is what would prompt a person to even get a gun pull it out, and then pull the trigger. But if there's something that's going on in society that maybe is not taught at home, then how you solve a problem, or maybe the peer group pressure, I don't know. That, I'm, I'm very confused about this whole thing. And whether it's in a parkland school or whether the individual shooting here in Chicago, 
to me, is the, the national problem. Uh, you said you're confused. Maybe that person that takes those three huge steps on going to do those type of things, they probably didn't have the guidance that they needed or someone to actually sit there and be like, have you thought this out? Are you sure this is what you're going to do? Is this the right thing? Is this the wrong thing? Like, actually had someone make them sit there and think about their actions before they do it. Because, like, in the anger that they're in, most of the time, when people get angry, they let their anger take over their thoughts. So, if someone else sits there to be able to calm them down, so the anger is not taking over the thoughts, and the thoughts are actually flowing, they, they won't actually take those three huge steps. And I don't know if that helped, but I hope it did. I, I also, we live in a very violent country. Like we are inundated with images that tell us that like violence will get you your answer. And I don't think that, I mean, as artists, we, we get to live in a space of ambiguity and process and figuring it out. But most folks, like one of my things that I try to drive home with my students that there is not necessarily like this is the one right way. So I think that when there's a conflict, oftentimes it's like, well, if I don't solve this, if it's not right, it's wrong. I need a direct answer and, you know, amplify that to the nth degree and then that might trigger someone to go, well, this is the only response I have right now. So the combination of the violence that we see perpetrated by our country <coughs> onto the rest of the world and then given access to a gun, those things, you know, then you have your answer there as to how you're going to solve your conflict. I think that we should do more in figuring out how we can cultivate a space that, okay, well, let's, let's try to work through this murky, ambiguity, these feelings I'm feeling, have a, a language about our emotions and about things that we come across when, you know, your brains are young and mushy and like you don't mess, or grown, um, you know, so how we can continue to be more uh, emotionally intelligent so that we don't think that, okay, well, violence is the only option that I have. Also, People are traumatized a lot of the time, especially living in Chicago. Like, we see a lot of things that it's not normal to like see somebody die or to like see a gun fire and to even know what a gun looks like before like you're grown, before you can process the information. And we normalize it here and we, we normalize it in Chicago and it's like it's not a big deal. And sometimes if you haven't, it's kind of weird. But everywhere else, that's not what people see. So I think a lot of times we kind of push back the idea that children are traumatized, that like 17 year olds, that 14 year olds traumatized about a lot of the things that they see. And we don't have trauma informed schools. We're closing mental health centers. We just don't have the spaces to have the conversation. So a lot of the times children feel shut out or we, we definitely feel shut out, like we can't have those conversations, that there's nobody to go and talk to. So a lot of the times when they're taking that first step of, oh, I'm gonna go get this gun, it's like, in their mind, that's all that they know. So then, even having the conversation with people around them, that also might be that first person solution, even if it's an adult, you know? It could be somebody who's 35, who they've known their whole life, and they're also like, oh yeah, you definitely need to go get the gun. So even having those conversations, if if you're traumatized from a young age and also misinformed as you're getting older, then a lot of the decisions you make aren't necessarily what we want to say is right or what we want to say is the most informed decision you could possibly make. So I think what it might look like is being able to open up spaces to have those conversations for people who are traumatized and for people who may be misinformed about the right things to do. And because a lot of times we have conversations like this and it looks like a bunch of people who already know what they need to do. Or those people who already have, who already have those spaces to have the conversations. And it's not the people who don't. So opening up spaces like this to people who don't know that there are spaces to have the conversation, then, then we start to like, just take that tiny step to be able to say you have people to talk to and you have a place to go. Sorry, uh, really quick. Um, 
I think on top of all of that, um, we have these things in schools called um, counselors, right? <coughs> and everyone assumes that counselors are like, let's talk about your feelings. They're not therapists. They're there to get you in classes and get you into college. And so people use school counselors as an excuse. You know, and like the counselors are doing their job. That is literally their job, is to get you into classes and get you into college, because they have 1,500 other kids to get into classes in college, right? But that's used as an excuse a lot of times. It's like, oh, well, they could have talked to their counselor. The people that are saying these things have never been in a room with a counselor. They've never been a student sitting in front of a counselor, because you don't, yeah, they're not, they're not a therapist, and that's all I can say, really. And um, so they're never, there's not that resource in schools to resolve those conflicts or to kind of find an emotional outlet that a lot of people don't have at home. Um, a, lot of, a lot of kids that don't have um, many friends don't have in general. Um, and so when you don't have that outlet in school or at home or just in your other life, um, you find other outlets that you see on TV, that you see in your video games. And I'm not blaming the video games or TV, because I'm done with that excuse too. But you see your glorious revenge plot, right? And it looks like the best plan, because you have no other, you have nothing else that you can do, but you do have a gun, right? I, um, we are going to be closing out this section. Um, and in closing, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists. And um, my closing thought is that, um, on this question of what it looks like if we win. So today, on that same corner of 79th and Cottage, there is a healing salon uh, that has opened, and the healing salon has healers of all different types who are investing in the community and opening their doors to make Reiki and massage and all sorts of um, spiritual and emotional healing opportunities easily accessible to people. And I think that it's important that we recognize that we can abandon the um, places that are difficult, but we can recognize the complexity of this city, and we can throw our creativity and our energy and our voices and our talents in to go into the difficult space, whether that difficult space is a space of conversation, whether that difficult space is a school, whether that difficult space is a street corner, to be willing to have the courage and wherewithal to go in and to confront it. So um, thank you to all the panelists, and thank you all for being here. We're going to transition. <laughs> You all so much. Uh, so now we're going to break you all into three groups uh, and we're going to do breakout groups and what we're going to do is create action plans, five step action plans of things we can do in our communities, through our art, and through our schools. So Becca and Ben are going to sort of shepherd you to a group. We'll do this for about 15 minutes and then we'll share our findings. Thanks.
Okay. Then maybe people will just talk about it.